The thing that we do not understand is, Swami's grace is always there for us. Just for the asking. You know, it is there. But we don't ask. But we don't ask. Chaudhry Valetti, the famous Los Angeles cardiac surgeon who later would work directly under Sai Baba's direction, says people need to turn to Sai Baba more. Some people in one of the centers in the United States, and the lady had a very interesting question. She said, Doctor, I had an emergency the other day, and I had to call 911, and then think of Swami. And I said, no, that's not the way it should be. They're not mutually exclusive. They're mutually complementary. You can think of Sai Ram and Sai Ram and still call 911. That's one of the things Swami tells us. You don't think of me enough. In this vintage movie shot years ago, Sojourns has found perhaps the most compelling account of how Dr. Valetti arrived at Sai Baba's side, in Dr. Valetti's own words. And with his permission, we include it now into our Sojourns library of great spiritual stories. And one day I was walking through our intensive care unit in the hospital where every day, like the thought of the day, they write something on the bulletin board and they said there, coincidence is a miracle where Almighty wishes to remain anonymous. And it didn't make much sense to me when I read it, but then it so happened the next several months, so many coincidences happened in my life that that old Irish proverb started becoming more and more uh, meaningful. This uh, colleague of mine, who is Dr. Inot Tumati, though he's a cardiologist and I'm a cardiac surgeon, we have never met. And we started our jobs, he as the chief of cardiology and I as the director of cardiac surgery in a hospital in California, halfway across the world from uh, Puttaparthi, having never seen each other before. So that to me is one of the most uh, you know, coincidences you can see. Then we were all both interested in uh, doing service to people, especially in India, because cardiac surgery and cardiology, though is so rampant, is very, very expensive, not within the reach of almost 95% to 97% of the Indian population. So we both always wanted to go and do some uh, service providing you know, cardiac care. But both had very bad experiences because the corporate world that runs 99% of the cardiac surgery in India is absolutely corrupt and it um, uh, caters only for the rich, you know, top two or three percent. So we got disenchanted. But then one time, Tumati had to go for his uh, nephew's wedding. You know, every Indian wedding runs for three days or five days, and it's the most confusing thing. Nobody knows who is coming, who is going. And in that confusion, all of a sudden, a stranger that Dr. Tumati has never seen gives him a card that has pictures of two, you know, holy men on uh, each half of this card and says, look, there is a beautiful super specialty hospital that does free cardiac surgery. You should visit it. And before Tumati realized the gravity of what the man was saying, the man totally disappeared and he could never find him then or since. And anyway, he took the clue <clears throat> and went to visit this, uh, you know, super speciality hospital in Puttaparthi, which was a very rough eight-hour, uh, you know, ride for him. But he was able to go there, and then at the same time, he even was able to make rounds along with the holy man who runs this hospital or who is the man behind it from his perspective, which he later found out was uh, Sai Baba. And uh, he made the rounds with him, and uh, he was so impressed, the minute he came back to California, he started bugging me and said, here is your dream, here is your dream, you must go back and see this in a hospital. And I said, what hospital is this? And he said, oh, it does free cardiac surgery. And I said, uh, 
uh, Ramakrishna is his name, I said, Ramakrishna, free cardiac surgery is an oxymoron. You know, you and I have traveled all over the world. We know how expensive cardiac surgery is, and free cardiac surgery is an oxymoron statement. And he, no, he, he wouldn't let go. And then again, at the same time, you know, you wouldn't believe another coincidence. They had um, their regional or what we call national uh, cardiothoracic and vascular surgeons of India had an international meeting and um, I was asked to participate in it because I was one of the uh, what we call NRIs, you know, non-resident Indians and they also wanted to recognize some of us who are non-resident Indians and that's how I ended up going to Hyderabad and from there I went to Bangalore and from Bangalore it's a short, uh, you know, car ride uh, to Puttaparthi. So, uh, of course, my interest was only in the hospital and uh, first thing I visited was the hospital only and uh, from outside you look at it and now you know why people call it a temple of healing. It's not just called a super specialty hospital. It's one of the most arresting buildings that I have ever seen that could be a hospital and then inside again it was astonishing to see how clean it is, how calm it is, how clutterless it is and how people are going about doing their business and one of the junior administrators was nice enough to be able to take me around and show me the whole hospital and the most surprising thing was the equipment they have though it's a free hospital is totally state of the art, something that I'm used to working in United States. So it was so compelling that I said, oh, this is the place that I should work. This is the place I should work. But then of course, all around looking, looking, you see, you know, Swami's pictures. And then of course, I realized this must be the man, you know, behind it. Then we went into the ashram. Of course, the ashram is another different life totally. Once you are inside the uh, compound wall of the ashram, everything again is very predictable, very orderly. And um, then uh, next day morning, we were in the uh, you know, darshan line. And another biggest coincidence again was that um, I ended up sitting in the front line. I have no idea how I ended up there. And I was in the front line. And, um, uh, you know, my nephew next to me said, uh, Uncle, if you pray to your, uh, you know, favorite, uh, you know, God that you always meditate or pray on, Swami will uh, speak to you. <laughs> and I got a little laugh and I said, listen, there are about 10,000 people here. You think Swami is going to speak to me? He said, no, 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 Uncle, you pray. You pray and meditate and concentrate and Swami will speak to you. So, of course, uh, you know, our family deity is Lord Balaji, Mahavishnu, and I'm used to meditating, I'm used to praying every day. So, um, the next thing I know, you know, there was this beautiful music, and Swami was gliding down, and uh, I opened my eyes, and uh, he was standing right in front of me, staring into my eyes. And, of course, you know, once you ever lock your vision with, you know, Swami, you are never the same. And then, of course, I blurted out and I said, Swami, I am Dr. Chaudhary from Los Angeles. And he gave one of those beautiful, you know, smiles and said, yes, yes, I know who you are. And, of course, <laughs> then he materialized some vibhuti for me. And before I realized, uh, you know, he was gone. And I thought that was so beautiful. But that wasn't the end of it. After the darshan, the next thing I know, there was this man running to me and said, uh, Oh, Swami wants to see you. I said, Oh my goodness, that's even better. So I went and, uh, you know, they opened this beautiful, you know, nice wooden, you know, ornate kind of a door and literally pushed me into this room and closed the door. It's a very small room, maybe about 10 feet by 10 feet, 10 feet by 12 feet. And there I was, and there uh, was Swami at the other end. And uh, the other thing that's a coincidence of all coincidences is I speak the same language that Swami speaks, you know, Telugu, because I was born only a hundred miles from Puttaparthi. And then, of course, you know, the rest is uh, really 
nothing but history and history and only way Swami can orchestrate that history. And now, you know, I have to digress a little bit here because I was talking about coincidences. Like I said, I was in Hyderabad for this international you know, cardiac surgical meeting and I asked a few um, cardiologists and cardiac surgeons about this uh, super specialty hospital that does free heart surgery. It was amazing to find out that half of them didn't know about this hospital. The other half that knew about the hospital said, oh yeah, there's a hospital there, but it's going to close in an year or two because you know how expensive it is to do you know, heart surgery. That was dampening a little bit my spirits to go there. Then the other amazing coincidence is this boyhood friend of mine who was in Bangalore, who is arranging all this thing for me, said, oh, just come over, you know, we'll send you to a Puttaparthi. So um, uh, that morning he was very busy, so uh, I started traveling to Puttaparthi with his uh, wife and son. Then when I'm pushed into this uh, interview room and the door closes, the most uh, amazing thing was uh, there is this, uh, you know, five foot three person with a big uh, halo of hair and one of the most beautiful smiles you can ever see and suddenly looks at me and like I said, one of the uh, coincidences, like I said earlier, was we speak the same language and he looks at me, this is the first time I have ever seen him at least my perspective wise and I thought the same first time he ever saw me he looked at me and the very first words he said were uh, in Telugu he said uh, how come you lost weight and that is like they were not just what he said the way he said it with so much love in what he said and uh, I just literally uh, was shaken because six weeks before I started this trip I developed a very bad uh, tooth abscess and um, you know if you are a physician in the United States you get extra attention and everybody wants to help you so uh, they started putting temporary filling that fell off and then they put one more temporary filling that fell off and there was a huge cavity in my tooth and they said oh you can't go to India because if you get infected you get you know infection in the jawbone and that's a big deal and I said no way this is something I have to do so uh, they gave me a contrivance to clean my mouth and the tooth every time I ate something so for six weeks I was on soups and uh, you know and sure enough I lost about 10 pounds but unless somebody you're working with me you will never know you look at somebody for the first time and how could you tell so when he looked at me, which I assumed so far at my own limited perception that first time I saw him, first time he seeing me and when he said, how come you lost weight, I just literally broke down and then of course he calmly said, you know, don't worry, don't worry, you know, the tooth is going to be fine. Of course, that's the uh, icing on the cake and uh, I couldn't recover, uh, you know, myself, really could not recover myself. And then I realized that what's going on is not something ordinary and there is this person that uh, can look through somebody and know everything about that somebody, past, present, in a future of not this one life, probably many, many previous lives, that was the impression I had. And the next thing he was very direct and uh, he said, what do you want? <laughs> And now I know that's his characteristic way of asking everybody, you know, what do you want? And I said, uh, Swami, I want peace. And uh, his answer to that was very simple. He said, uh, take I away, take want away, and what is left behind. And I said, Swami, peace. He said, you see, it's very simple. Of course, I didn't have any clue what he was telling. Of course, it took me about 10, 12 years after that to realize what exactly he said. And because my uh, limited perception was that he's going to give me some secret somewhere, a book to read or a, a prayer to pray to get peace. But the way he said, take I away and take one away and you're left with peace is like a mathematical equation. So um, I let it go by because I wasn't really impressed at that point. And then I came to the... Uh, issue that was forefront in my mind and said, Swami, I want to work in your hospital. 
and immediately he had a big big smile on his face and he said oh don't worry this is your hospital you can come whenever you want to come you can do as much work as you want to do and he also said that you know we'll have apart from the two existing operating rooms we'll have one more room and you can do it's your hospital no problem and that's exactly what i was looking for and what i wanted to hear and of course that's the beginning of this uh, in a journey and uh, my uh, own uh, uh, you know human thinking was that i was going there and doing service to people that's what i wanted to do all my life but i never did realize that that was only like a very minor part of the whole picture rest of the picture is that every trip i made there it was for my benefit for my understanding of my own self to look inside and slowly and slowly look inside and then understand or at least try to understand who i am what i am here for what my priorities are and with the help of swami every trip has been a lesson and then like i said it took me 10 12 years to realize what is getting rid of that i and what is getting rid of that want and how when you do that you have no choice except to end up with peace you know at this juncture i should tell you a little bit about uh, you know the hospital itself like i uh, alluded earlier it's called the temple of healing i had the privilege of um, <clears throat> meeting the uh, you know the um, architect uh, mr kuchlov and um, how swami with his what we call vajra sankalpa you know something he wishes it will happen built this hospital within exactly 12 months and uh, when i spoke to professor kuchlov he happens to be the uh, dean of uh, prince of school of architecture prince of wales in a school of architecture and he told me that it took them about close to a uh, 7 months 15 architects to draw the plans for the hospital and only 5 months was left for this indian construction company to finish this 300000 square foot of hospital space you know building a house is very easy building a hospital is very complex you have so many restraints so many constrictions and so many policies to follow because you have critical care areas you have operating rooms you have access from say substrial to sterile area and the flow everything has to be so meticulously planned just to give you an idea we run a i mean cardiac surgery is always done in a tertiary specialty hospital and our group they were interested in building another tertiary hospital and it took us 3 years just to get plans approved and professor kirchlov himself confessed that in any industrial country whether it is germany whether it is united states uk this hospital would have taken 7 years to be completed but if you look into the history in um, november 22nd of 1990 swami proclaimed that exactly one year from now in that barren land of 110 plus acres there would be a super specialty hospital and on the very first day they would do heart surgery true to his word they not only just did one but four open heart surgeries and this hospital was really built in 5 months construction time and a whole year and that itself is a miracle is a miracle now how you explain it it's all in your own way of understanding it and we generally call it as inspirational energy that's the way that swami inspires people you put in 150% of your energy now when you look at the hospital it has a central dome and then two wings on either side the way the whole uh, concept was that when the patient walks in he literally walks into the bosom of swami and gets into his embrace now 
People always ask me, how did you change? What did you learn from Swami? How do you practice different now since you are exposed to Swami? You see, especially in the Western society, medicine is practiced in a very different way. What I mean by that is, you have a system that is layered and layered and, you know, mostly bureaucratic because it's paid by an insurance company. But it works. It works very well. But you could almost go and call it an impersonal system because all you are interested is the patient has his insurance and the insurance is, has its ability to pay, which is what it was at least when I started coming to Swami. But in uh, the Eastern society, it's very different. I mean, majority of the people cannot afford, uh, you know, serious cardiac surgery business, and that's how Swami started this hospital. But this concept that I'm going to explain now, which was put forward to me from Swami himself as early as 1993, is he said, you know, you cannot treat the patient as a disease. There are three aspects to every patient. You know, his physical ailment, his mental ailment, and his soul, which is the seat of his entire personality. You have to treat all three of them. Of course, this concept is totally alien even to me with my Eastern background. But when Swami said that that's how you should do, my whole approach to medicine has really, really became different. I mean, even otherwise, I was always a very God-fearing person. Even in the Western world, I would tell them an oft quote of mine is, man cuts and God heals, which I strongly believed in. For a cardiac surgeon, you know, it's very, very difficult to come forth with that kind of a statement because we have so much ego. We feel that we do everything and, uh, you know, we are the... Uh, God's gift to mankind in a way. Majority of us do feel that way, but I always had this little bit of humility, I would say a little bit, to accept that man cuts but God heals. But once I got exposed to Swami, this philosophy of treating patient as a whole entity, you know, it's not just a disease, it's just not a, a number. We always have codes for each disease in the United States. But with Swami's blessings, I realized that you don't treat it as a code, you treat the patient, you know, his disease, and then his mental makeup, and then his, you know, soul, or whatever you want to call it in any different ways. So much so that when the patient walks into this hospital, the first place he comes into is a central dome. That is a marvelous architectural piece. It's about 150. 40 feet tall and there's a 20 foot tall chandelier weighing a little over two tons hanging in and there is so much serenity there is so much peace the patient walks in and I always felt that the first impression a patient gets out of a hospital goes a long long way in treating him or getting the most benefit and number two you look anywhere in the hospital the only most important thing missing, really missing, is a cashier's desk. That's the only way people can say that it is a free hospital. There is no cashier's desk in the hospital. So the patient has absolutely no financial responsibility. And then when he walks in and walks into this ambience, which is so alien to him, he doesn't expect it. He comes into this clean, calm hospital and then gets into this main dome and looks around and then already feels better. This is the concept that Swami put into my own mind and this is what I try to incorporate into my own you know, teachings, not to treat the patient as a number, but treat the patient you know, as three-sided or three-dimensional you know, approach. Now, I am very happy to say in 2003, 2004, 2005, the Western world, actually Western Medical Society, has finally got a grasp of it. And now almost uh, half the universities or uh, in a medical school teach spirituality and medicine.
really do teach spirituality and medicine. And now, if you look at, there are so many, maybe hundreds of studies, double-blind studies that are being done. What is the effect of spirituality? What's the effect of prayer? What's the effect of medicine in the outcome of any procedure that is done to a hospital? So you can see that how far-fetching Swami's teachings were as way back as 1993 when he was telling us that you must combine all these three aspects and now only the Western society has realized the importance of combining all these three you know, approaches. In um, mid-80s, um, uh, they did a study in the entire medical population of United States of America and they found out only about 50-55% of the practicing physicians actually believed in God. But he said the latest study done in the early 1990s shows that more than 75% of the practicing physicians, you know, believe in God. Now you could see that when you look at Swami and his way of practicing medicine, how universal it is. Prataparthi is a very small town. Very small town. This is what that he inculcates in almost everyone that practices in that hospital. That's the other thing most awakening for me, like a rude awakening, because people who work in that hospital have nothing in common. They come from all over the country, sometimes all over the world. The people from Italy working there, the people from Malaysia working there, people from Ceylon working there, people from Australia working there, obviously, people from United States. Within the country of India, the people from all the states, they don't speak the same language, they don't belong to the same religion, but the common thread they have is the sense of service that Swami has inculcated in them. And that is very, very humbling for somebody like me to go and see how this very fundamental thread of the sense of service to these poor people keeps them all in one page. And at the same time, also everybody knows that when this patient walks into that hospital, that is his last hope. Now, I just want to talk a little bit more about how Swami basically, you know, influenced my own thinking. You know, I alluded earlier about, you know, changing in my practice and all that. I was another, you know, very ordinary guy, enjoyed eating, drinking, meat, eating and then drinking, you know, alcohol once in a while. But once I got into Swami's fold, you know, I did not realize what people used to say, you know, my life is my message. When Swami said, my life is my message, it looks like a very catchy phrase. But when you're exposed to it, you know exactly what He means by my life is my message. He lives the simple blessed life I have ever seen. I'll give you one simplest example. We were all sitting around him one day and he always wears the same kind of robes and there are always three or four you know buttons that are you know buttoned right up to the neck and he removed one of those buttons and gave it us to look at it. We thought there must be at least uh, you know gold buttons if not you know gold covered. They were not. They were just regular nickel buttons you could buy you know a dozen of them for uh, you know 10 rupees and that's how he talks when he says you know my life is my message nobody does anything for him he does everything for himself and time is perfect and then again he says you must have combination of the three things what you think what you say what you do must all be the same you can't think one way, you can't see the other way, and you can't do the third way, which most of us do. That's the other thing. So now, when I say something, even before I say it, I think twice what I'm saying. And then, I don't say it unless I actually feel what I'm saying, and I won't say it unless I'm absolutely sure I can execute it also. If you just think of these things, just take a minute and think about these things. It has one of the most farthest fetching implications because it sounds very easy. He calls it Trikarana Suddhi, you know, the marriage of these three aspects of, uh, you know, thought, 
what you say and what you do. And if there is no harmony between these three, then there is no sense in one's life. That's basically how I come across with it. Because you see that in every action of you know, Swami, how he does, you know, what he does, what he eats. It's the most basic provisions in life. And he needs very few things, very little he needs. His discipline in all those three aspects is so important that uh, if we can practice it, we really, really will be achieving a, a significant improvement in ourselves as a human being. And the other thing that I have learned from him is there is no room for being a part-time, you know, the Swami devotee. You might as well not be a devotee because you are representing Swami. You are expressing his ideas. You are an example for him. If you cannot be that all your 24 hours, then I don't think there's any need for it. You know, I say it, it's not that I am doing it 100%, but I strive, I still strive. There are a few slip-ups here and there, but I do strive. And that's my request to everybody, do strive. He never wanted you to be a great man. No, no. Swami always says, there's no, nothing exactly great about being a great man, but there is a lot great about being a good person. That's what he wants us all to be, just a good you know, person. And then again, this streamlining all happens if we put service ahead of our other things. I think that to me is the other very important lesson I learned from Swami. Because I read somewhere, even before I met Swami, service is the rent we pay for living in this world. And I do strongly believe in that. If you cannot help a fellow human being in distress, what's the use of what has God given to you? I mean, I can say it now very easy because I've seen both sides of life. I've seen when the way I was so selfish, looking for money, looking to buy bigger cars. I'll give you one more example, which will be very, it will drive the point home. I always asked for uh, more money when I used to work in a large group. So one day I was driving out of the parking lot in my, you know, Mercedes and uh, the um, administrator stops by and says, Chaudhary, you're driving such a, nice car, what do you want more money for? And my immediate answer was, Don, I could buy a nicer car. But today, he asks me the same thing, I'll tell you I need more money because I want to do more service to the poor people, needier people, people less fortunate than I am. If all of us can just practice that one thing, I think life would still, life would still be a you know, much, much nicer thing. But that's one thing so good. But all these people, we have network of physicians that come from all over the world and work in Swami's hospital. The common thread I see in all of them, talking to them, is their sense of service. They want to serve. I saw people from Scotland. I met people from Australia. And I met, you know, people from Austria, people from South America, Italy. They all come, they all come, want to serve. That's their main aim, want to serve. Of course, Swami is the magnet. And the other thing that's very interesting is, Swami has never, never asked anybody to come and work there. Typical example is me. I've never even known him. I didn't have any clue that there was a person like Swami. I went there only for the hospital because, you know, I wanted to serve. So if I have to say any... See, the other thing I want to mention here is, this selfless service that we do has so many ripple effects. I'll give you one simple example. They operated on a young girl, about five or six years old, with a hole in her heart. The father happens to be a truck driver, very poor, and he has no wife because his wife died when her uh, kids were young. And he somehow wanted his daughter to get better. He has no financial way of taking care of it. So he brought her over to the Bangalore hospital where they have done this whole operation, which normally outside costs about 150,000 rupees very easily. There's no way in his entire 10 lives he could afford something like that. And it was done free. He didn't have any financial commitment. And uh, he took her home. He was very happy. Everything was happy. And the most amazing thing was, six months afterwards when he 
brought her for a you know the doctor to see her and a follow up they found one of the most amazing things from this man you know he's a one, one of those rough uneducated people you know who drive a truck for a living he has his usual habits of meat eating drinking smoking that's his way of life then apparently after he went home he was so moved at the kind of service that was provided to his daughter free of cost from people he has never met from people who he not going to meet again have no parallel there is no parity with it. they don't belong to his religion they don't belong to his region these people are aliens to him but still they did everything free to him and he kept thinking in his own mind what can i do what can i do so you would never believe what he has done is in the six months he stopped smoking he stopped drinking and he stopped eating meat see how one good deed has such tremendous amount of ripple effects this is what swami talks about you know one good deed you do a good deed in sincerity its effects are so so far fetching this you see every day in that hospital because most of the people who come there are free they come from all over the country foreign countries also this is their last resort because they can't afford any of it and the minute they walk into the hospital and see this ambience and then meet these people that they never know and they first of all don't believe that it's going to be free and when they're ready to leave they're so happy there and 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 you see these people in the intensive care unit you know they are like 3 month old or 6 month old they're so happy they all have a nice big you know vibhuti on their forehead they're all you know smiling they're all happy and uh, it's a whole different world and i think the main force behind all this again is just swami and swami's philosophy that uh, you know hands that work are better than lips that pray you know in a way many of his sayings are so practical really so practical and um, you know service to others is the most important thing so these are all things that he has you know brought out and again to uh, practice this is that is his main insistence on all of us practice them you know practice them day in and day out you don't have to practice when i'm around only that's what that makes you yeah part time devotee you cannot be a part time devotee you have to be a full time devotee so my difficult issue was not just practicing what i was practicing when i am in puttaparthi but put the same principles back into my practice when i went back to united states it took me a while but then slowly slowly i started incorporating his teachings and you know practicing first i was a little worried that people would not understand but you'll be very surprised how many people are so comfortable with the thought that there is somebody beyond us i just call in the western country i just call him the man upstairs you know you could call god you could call man upstairs but they are so comfortable when you tell them you know you don't have the same religious background you don't practice the same religion but still i think the common thread is god again and once that is brought into a, the picture everything becomes you know very very easy that's what that swami tells you you know i am a god you are god i know that but you don't know that and but trying to know that i think that is the beginning and once you start that inward journey to learn who you are what that makes you comfortable how you can be peace at yourself you can wake up in the morning look at yourself in the mirror and feel comfortable at what you look at and that's what swami helps you to do that helps you very much but you must be willing to take that help and then do it you know as you come to know you know more and more about swami or uh, the way i put it is uh, when you come into his orbit i don't think it happens just like that i think it is a process of culmination of what has happened not just in this lifetime but many 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 lifetimes before one um, very beautiful example i can relate myself is i had the fortune of going to uh, kodaikanal with swami with uh, three other uh, very very evolved uh, souls one of them is um, a retired uh, professor professor uh, you know sampath 
and uh, one day there was just it's so fortunate that there were only four of us and Swami was standing and Professor Sampath looked at Swami and said Swami it must be something we have done in this lifetime that we are this close to you Swami and Swami looked at him without batting an eyelash and said Sampath not this lifetime last hundred lifetimes so it just gives you an idea of meaning of life that's the first glimpse I had about what this meaning of life is how cumulative these effects are you know God gives you this chance this is where the biggest question comes if everything is predestined what is the free will of man the way I look at it is God gives us a patch of land you can sow in it whatever you want to sow you can sow a mango tree and reap mangoes or you can sow you know marijuana or and you know so and reap that thing so it's your choice that's where I think Swami says you can turn the lock to the right or turn the lock to the left that's your free will his grace is always there but you have to use it and that's I think where we majority of us you know miss the boat because you need to use it and use it in the right way and he also said one time very beautifully like we say in surgery, you know, so, so much parallelism from what Swami says and what I find in life in surgery. We always say in surgery, there's no neutral action. When you make a move in surgery, it's either going to benefit the patient or going to hurt the patient. Same way in life, you know, Swami says there is what you call a reaction, reverberation and resounding for everything you do and one day he was explaining to us that there are three kinds of reactions three kinds only something you do for example you cut your skin it bleeds right away this we call some of the actions you do there's a very immediate reaction then there are other actions like you eat your food it takes three four hours for it to digest so some of the actions you make they be about three four hours before there is an effect of it or you sow a seed it takes five years for it to grow and ten years for it to bear fruit so some of your actions may take five or ten years to make an effect but there's always an effect so the corollary to this is whenever you act you have to think and what he says you think not that it's good for you no that would be the last decision you have to make the first decision you have to make is is it going to be good for everybody involved in the equation but unfortunately the way society is today we think of ourselves is my act is going to be good for me for my family and that's where the degradation starts but Swami always says when you act you act and decide that it's good for everybody in the equation not just for you alone that's selfishness if you can get out of that selfish mode then again what is his grace do for a person you know it doesn't make you a millionaire no you go to him to become a millionaire you're going him for the wrong reason I think what he does for you is to be a better person how do you become a better person you know mother moha Mascherium, Logo, and all these qualities are there. We're born with it. We're born with it. Of all these things, are, to me personally, the two most important things to overcome is your anger and your greed and lust. And if you follow Swami's teachings, you can get rid of them. It's not very easy, but you should try. You should try. Because anger is the worst thing really because it destroys you anger can slowly slowly destroy you this is a medical fact it's not something that I'm talking at a very higher psychological or super psychological level a practical thing when you get angry the worst damage is done to you not to the other person the same way jealousy and greed it's a very important thing I always used to be jealous because I worked very hard all my life if I saw somebody driving a bigger car, a better car than me, I would worry. How come I work so hard and that guy is driving a bigger car? Now I, when I look at somebody being more prosperous, driving a bigger car or any of that, I automatically feel the guy deserves it. And that gives you a very nice feeling. 
It's not just that car is comparable to anything because that's the first thing that comes into my mind. The same way, if I see somebody very religious, doing things for other people, I feel so happy. I used to feel so jealous. Look at this. God has given him so many opportunities to help everybody else. No. God gives all of us opportunities to help others. Some of us take it and some of us don't take it. And that particular person took it and he's able to do it. And that's what Swami makes in us. Wakes up that instinct to help the people in need. And if you miss that, you know you miss the whole boat. The same way. He says, you know, he has come here to metamorphose us, make us better people, really make us better people. His grace is always there. Grace is always there. When he says you, I'm in front of you, above you, behind you, below you, it really is true. I'll tell you one other example about this, which has probably opened my eyes much more. One of my visits was to uh, South America in Rio, and uh, in the poorest of the uh, slums in Rio, they have a school for Swami. And there I met this very lovely young lady. And uh, she was so involved into Swami's teachings and Swami's school. She's a teacher there. And I asked, when was the last time you saw Swami? And she laughed and she said, I've never even been to India. And I said, you're crazy. You haven't even been to India and you're doing Swami's work here. I said, how do you do this? Where is Swami? What's Swami to you? And she looked at me straight in my eyes and says, Swami is here. You know, I go around saying that, oh my goodness, I'm doing so much work for Swami, I'm curing so many patients. When I heard this lady, so simple and so straightforward and so lovely saying that Swami is here, you know, I'm doing Swami's work, that, that literally opened up my perspective. You don't have to go to Puttaparthi. You don't have to do Swami's work in Puttaparthi. That's one of the things he made a point later because I want to quit everything I was doing in Los Angeles and go and work in Swami's hospital. He said, no, it's not necessary. All are my patients. You work in Puttaparthi, you work in Los Angeles, it's the same for me. They're all my patients. See, this is what is, you know, universality of, you know, Swami. The thing that we do not understand is, Swami's grace is always there for us. Just for the asking. You know, it is there, but we don't ask some people in one of the centers in the United States. And the lady had a very interesting question. She said, Doctor, I had an emergency the other day, and I had to call 911, and then think of Swami. And I said, no, that's not the way it should be. They're not mutually exclusive. They're mutually complementary. You can think of Sairam and Sairam and still call 911. That's one of the things Swami tells us. You don't think of me enough. You don't ask me the right things. That is what education is. That's what becoming a better person. What to ask from Swami and not to forget about Him. He is our best friend. Maybe He's the only friend all of us have. Because all our other relationships are at a worldly level. Yes, you need a wife, no question about it. You have children. But Really, honestly, the only friend you have is Swami because of His most unselfish love. And again, the corollary to that is what He tells. The only asset He has is love. And we are all shareholders in that love.